Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, today's Native American Heritage Month presentation with uh, Dr. Wensler Nosey Sr. It is my honor to introduce him today um, and have him present to us. Dr. Nosey is a former Peridot District Councilman and Tribal Chairman of the San Carlos Apache Tribe, which consists of nearly 17,000 tribal members on the San Carlos Apache Reser uh, Reservation. San, Carol, San Carlos stretches across from Gila, Graham, and Pinal counties, totaling to 1.8 million acres, and it is situated in the southeastern portion of the state. Wensler was born on July 10, 1959, on the San Carlos Apache Reservation. He was raised in the tradition, traditional Apache way. He graduated from the, from the Globe High School in May of 1978 and attended Merritt College in Oakland, California, um, then attended Phoenix College in, Fe in Phoenix <laughs> and completed the State of Arizona Banking Academy. Dr. Nosey specializes in bioethics, sustainability, and global public health. Following college, Dr. Nosey returned to San Carlos to, and began his employment as the Tribal Work Experience Program Director in 1982. In 1988, he was elected to the to Tribal Council for the Peridot District, and was, uh, which governs the San Carlos Apache Tribe through the its amendment or its amended constitution and bylaws being federally recognized in the 1954, in 1954 through the US Indian Re uh, Reorganization Act. Wensler, Wensler then founded a Rural Opportunities of Arizona, ROA, in 1990 and individually owned, uh, business owned and operated by a tribal member, which uh, provided opportunities for tribal members to become skilled in trade and trained for jobs throughout Arizona. In 1995, Wensler established um, Apaches for Cultural Preservation and founded the Spirit of Mountain Runners in, 20, in 2000, which is a traditional runners organization. Dr. Dr. Nosey was reelected as the uh, Tribal Council Representative for Peridot District in 2004 to serve another four-year term. It was then, it was then, he was inspired to run for tribal chairman. Then in 2006, he was elected by the San Carlos Apache people as the, their tribal chairman. He was recognized in 2006 and given an, an honorable mention by Wake Forest University in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina for his coordination, bringing students from Wake Forest to San Carlos San Carlos Apache Reservation for a cultural integration program um, and was also recognized and honored in 2007 by the National Council of Churches for New York City uh, for his accomplishments in Indian country as a leader and spirit of spirituality among youth and uh, organizing many events for over 15 years, which includes having worldwide participation of sacred sacred runs and protection of Native American culture, tradition, and heritage. The National Council of Churches comprises over 30 million uh, membership throughout the nation. Uh, Dr. Nosey became an executive committee member of the Arizona State Democratic Party District 1 and introduced the resolution which established the Arizona Native American uh, Democratic Caucus. Uh, he was the first Native American electorate electorate, a uh, member of the National Electoral College of, for Arizona for Obama's first to term as president. He established the Apache Messenger newspaper in 2011 and owns uh, and operates the news, newspaper currently. He received the honor of being added to the Global or uh, Globe High School Hall of Fame for Sports in 2010 and again in 2012. Um, Dr. Nosey was re-elected as tribal council for the Peridot, uh, Peridot District. Um, he is or and has been an instrument instrumental over the course of his political career and uh, with the tribe in establishing the Apache Gold Casino Bashes and currently the Peridot District uh, Enterprise 
which includes Apache Burger, True Value Hardware, uh, PDEE, Shopping Center, etc. He has also uh, been appointed as the San Carlos Recreation and Wildlife Director and has marked the uh, expanded and hunting uh, recreational area for the tribe. In 2013, uh, Dr. Nosey was, received the Presidential Award for National Progressive Baptist Convention uh, for his fight for human rights for all Native Americans. He is the first Native American to receive such an award. Uh, Dr. Nosey recently accepted a position with the American University of Sovereign Nations as professor in the practice of indigenous knowledge where he will be teaching a range of masters and doctoral program courses in uh, to students from around the world. Uh, Dr. Rent, Dr. Um, Nosy is married to Teresa Brand Nosy, a member of the Navajo Nation. Um, they reside in Peridot, Arizona, on the San Carlos Apache Indian Reservation, have six children and 17 grandchildren. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wensler is a long distance ru runner and has participated in numerous marathons and half marathons over the years. He is uh, he's dedicated to the preservation and protection of Native American culture and artifacts. Um, history, religion, and tradition. He is the leader of the Apache Stronghold and director of uh, Gone by Gauze, ah, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, where he continues to advocate for indigenous, indigenous religious and human rights um, and protecting the future of our next generation of our next generations to come. It is my honor to welcome Dr. Nosey uh, as he presents on uh, copper mining and the fight for Oak Flat. Um, he's been instrumental to this. So welcome Dr. Nosey. Mm, thank you. Thank you for being with you all this morning. Okay. All right. I guess we just kind of jump right into mm -hmm. um, I think with those who are listening, uh, you probably uh, heard my, my background of all the things that I've done, um, which you know kind of points me out to today when I, I focus on what's religion, what's political, the environment and laws that the United States has, as well as laws that they exempt you know, uh, to corporations. And then the people of America, um, I think, um, one of the things that was really critical for me looking back is doing, you know, all the things that I've done um, for a reason, you know, and I always go back to the reason and the reason that people tend to forget is the founding of America and how it was founded and, you know, what, what made it to be what it is today. And I always go back to the fact that uh, the old saying that, you know, if you do something wrong, it always catches up with you somewhere. And it seems like, you know, we are in that time uh, of what's happening to America because of how uh, things were uh, founded and how it was established to create what we call America today. And uh, I think then the other crucial part as a human being is to understand that we, we always go through adjustments. You know, we always modify to, to fit the needs. And it is true, you know, being at 62 years old, you see the generations uh, I see the generations before me that have left and I see the generations behind me. And within that, you know, we got to remember uh, sustainability of life. You know, what, what do we actually have uh, for those yet to be born? And that's a, a really crucial part of uh, keeping um, a way of life going that has been blessed since the beginning of time. And so, you know, you look at all of these different components and, you know, I go back to the fact that when I was a child, uh, I look at my great grandfather um, who was uh, brought in as a prisoner of war. Uh, his son was a uh, forced march, which was my grandfather. And then my dad was born on the reservation as a prisoner uh, before um, an establishment uh, of a reservation. And then, uh, then, you know, comes the rest of us, comes the children after that. And so what I say is that, you know, in America, yes, you know, changes came over 500 years ago, but for the Southwest of Arizona, and, you know, I can only talk about, you know, San Carlos, the Apaches, 
is that it's it's only been 200 years, you know, uh, of of these great changes that have taken place. And so I will say that, you know, if you look at a, um, a rattlesnake, um, a snake where it goes, but then it has its last coil on the very top, I say that's who we are because we're able to see all the different changes that had taken place. And, you know, I, I think that speaking from that reference, you know, to the future is really important because we've seen, we've seen the good and we've seen the bad, you know, from, um, from all this transition. And, and that's why, you know, I, you know, I, I just want to make that clear to the listeners because your, your roots, your, your heritage, you know, where you came from is so important in whatever field or whatever career you're going to, you're going to take up. Because within that, there's uh, responsibilities, there's uh, integrity, there's uh, morals, um, there's all these important ingredients that makes up, you know, life. And if, if we forget those important ingredients, then sometimes we, we cater to a corporation that is devastating to, to all this life. And, you know, I say to myself that, you know, if I look at today to tomorrow, is the people that are in school, you know, the younger generation, they, they really need to know this so that they can begin to make moral decisions. Because evidently, you know, the ones before us, uh, either one didn't know uh, what was happening or why it was happening. Uh, and then there are those who did know, you know, for, that comes to greed, power and money of what they knew what they were doing. And they, know, they knew the devastation that was gonna take place. But now in this present time, we're, we're in that, you know, we're, we're in that situation where what it was over 500 years ago when they, they found this place, so to speak, from what they say, uh, is not the same anymore. 300 years ago, 200 years ago, you know, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 10 years ago, it's not the same anymore because we, we're, we're continuing to not make these moral decisions about what tomorrow's gonna be. And that's why I think it's so critical uh, for everybody, you know, to really step back and, and take a look at that. And, and that whatever your profession, your, whatever your career is going to be, you know, that word has to be in place about sustainability and, and why. And, you know, I, I say that because before, before I, what I'm going to talk about, so that this way you could have a better understanding where, where I'm coming from. So coming from um, a, a young man and, and seeing my grandfather uh, hearing the stories of my great grandfather because he had passed prior to me being born, but my my grandfather, my father, you know his his brothers, which is my uncles, you know I I grew up around them where uh, there was a lot of drinking, there there was a lot of crying, uh, there was a lot of emotions, and I just remember a time where it seems like nobody knew who they were or, or what was happening. Uh, it seems like we were just really in a in a mode of not going anywhere, and and I'm really grateful to be born to a mother that I was born to because my mother would take me aside and and talk to me uh, about the conditions of my dad and my uncles and my grandfather about what they were going through. Then she would talk to me about uh, what happened to her and her family and how uh, they were exiled out of the Prescott, Camp Verde area, and Force March in the San Carlos. And then talked to me about, my, you know, her in-laws, which is my dad's side, about the Chiricahuas and how, you know, what happened to them, them taking their whole reservation, well, not taking the reservation, but being forced out of there and being brought to San Carlos as prisoners of war. And then the dilemma that my grandfather was, great-grandfather was in, because him being a Chiricahua, that, um, that a month earlier that they had um, captured Geronimo and, and Geronimo's people, because that's the band I come from, and uh, was exiled out of Arizona forever. And so how my grandfather, great-grandfather was captured a month after and how they kept him as a prisoner of war in San Carlos and just kind of how the families met up and how we became to be who we are. But, you know, those were really... Uh, uh, devastating things to hear, you know, and and especially growing up in the time of the early '60s, you know, when you you had a booming country, you had a you know, uh, the life was exciting, and you know the uh, everybody was coming for the American dream, and you know all these things, and yet you know you lived on a reservation, and then the little times that we seen uh, 
TV commercials or you know movies on TV, it, it didn't apply to us because we still had federal policies that applied to us about staying on the reservation. So you know, one of the things that uh, I see is like really mis being misinformed because um, what has happened a long time ago is these federal policies, and that's where I go back to. You know, that's one of the things that. Um, got me really interested of, of these policies that affected our people and how our people interpreted and how they were misinformed and how, you know, the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs that were on the reservations were really, you know, an extension from the military. The, the, they had the military here first, then they went to the Bureau of Indian Affairs because, you know, as, as time was changing, it looked too drastic to have military placed here. So, you know, they had to go with a different name. But these people in the 1960s and 70s, around 77, 78, you know, they were still dressed with their military outfit. So from what our people remember as militaries being here in the late 1800s, early 1900s, then transitions into 1930, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and right up to the mid 70s. You know, you know, the the head officers still wore their uniforms. So, if if you look, you know, it from that perspective, and that's why it's really important when I talk about community, and how the social effects um, or how this affect our social life. It was a continued reminder of you know what happened to our people and why it happened. I guess, and. So the military presence made a really big uh, impression, you know, with the people all the way up to again, like I said, the mid seventies, and that's kind of where I seen my 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 uncles and my my father in the early sixties when uh, you know they, they they couldn't be who they could be, and so I always tell people, imagine what you're doing right now, and then just being put in a prison, and then eventually saying, you know, this is where you're going to live now. You know, you 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 make the best of it. And it's a complete change, you know, and there were um, military uh, generals who wrote to Washington and said, you know, you, you, you know, it's kind of like getting a, a wild animal and trying to make him a house pet, you know, they, they won't survive. And so a lot of our people at that time as well, during the time the reservation started, you know, a lot of them had um, had passed away from just not wanting to live anymore and not, you know, being able to cope with that kind of life. And then you know, of course, you know, we, we didn't, we didn't make, we didn't make the uh, alcohol, alcohol came in and it seemed to be, you know, the answer to a lot of the um, uh, un, un, unseen future, you know, for a lot of the people. And that's why, you know, a lot of them had taken up the alcohol to just relieve their depression, I guess. And so, but my mother was very critical and very strong and, and used to say that, you know, don't do this. Don't don't be like that because this is what they want you to be. They want you to forget everything from the past. You know they 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 don't want us to be who we are. Um, and so she was a, also a very religious individual in in our Apache way, and had had kept a lot of the prayers because a lot of that in our religion went underground because again there was a push to Christianize all of us, and um, so the people had to hide their ways. And so my mother lived in that, in, in keeping, you know, her, her Apache ways and not, not being seen. And so it was really uh, dramatic, you know, for my parents. Um, we, we learned uh, from them not to hug, you know, because, again, you know, my, my mom and my dad grew up in a time that with the military policy, uh, they would be plugged and be removed to Alabama, um, Oklahoma, you know, they would be sent away. And so a lot of the kids that exist today come from parents who hid in the mountains or grandparents who hid in the mountains. So my mother was one of them. And but she was caught two times and sent to the Phoenix Indian boarding school. And that when they were establishing that in the very beginning and was able to escape from there. And, you know, I, I know we mentioned I'm a marathon runner, but that comes from my mother because I was so impressed with her. Uh, at eight years old, and then again at nine, uh, running from uh, Phoenix all the way back to San Carlos, and you know, and, and I wanted to keep that um, way alive and, and, and dedicate that to my mother, because in her was survival. You know, hers was a suffering time, and just trying to get home back back to her people. So, you know, that's that's the era that you know my mother grew up, in, and even worse with my grandmother, you know, my great grandmother, with with her, you know, seeing a lot of the people being killed uh, 
because here in San Carlos, you know, they did in old San Carlos, they had posts where they had snipers. And so if they went beyond a certain line, you know, they got shot and we lost many of our people like that. And so it, it was more to concentrate everybody and know that, you know, they, they couldn't go anywhere unless they get killed or would get, get killed. Or even if they exercised their religion, they were incarcerated. So, you know, if you look at, you know, from my great grandmother to my mother, and then eventually in my generation, I come from a family of seven and my, uh, my, uh, my oldest ones uh, who graduated in 62 and 64, you know, we still had the federal policy to where um, a lot of the kids were sent to, uh, um, uh, they would be sent to the Bay Area in Oakland, California, San Francisco, you know, Chicago, they'd be sent, uh, uh, they, they called it the relocation program. And so when you graduated, if a reservation had a local high school or the nearest high school that accept native kids, if you graduated, then your next step was a relocation. So it wasn't a happy time for a parent in the 1960s, you know, because of your child graduating. Yes, that's great. But then on the second part of that, they, they had to leave. It was mandated. And so um, my mother lost her two oldest daughters uh, on this relocation program because, again, it was to force, you know, continue to force us to assimilate and, and you know, and, and, and lose the roots of who we are and the ties of who we are and you know and, and make a life in the city and so um my sisters went and um uh, both end up uh, uh staying in the bay area uh but my brother in 1968 uh graduated from globe and the federal policy changed to where if arizona colleges would accept native kids you know uh, they would be helped with uh, federal dollars and so um so anyway, in 1968, it changed. So my brother got a chance to stay and attend uh, Mesa Community College. So my mother did have two parties. Uh, this time, the parties were different. You know, uh, it was one graduating and the second one was that he could stay. So it was more about him staying in Arizona. And then it goes up to the 1970s where um, President Nixon finally passed the um, Self-Determination Act. Uh, which really changed the future for Native people. Uh, that gave us, as a government, more of a foot, tribal government, more of a foothold of making our own decisions of what and how we wanted to do. But you know, it take it took years before the Bureau of Indian Affairs really cooperated with the tribes and really began to transfer, you know, some of the decisions that uh, they were making for our people. So, like for an example. In, in 1973, uh, when my mother and I would uh, leave the reservation to go to Phoenix and stay overnight uh, to visit one of my brothers who was in school at the Phoenix Indian School, uh, um, my mother would have, there's a caseworker that was assigned to, you know, this one particular caseworker had like about 500 people underneath her. And so anytime we left the reservation, we had to notify her and when we we're going to return. So that ended like in around 1973, 74. And um, so, you know, so it was still a lot of work to take place and, and, and um, uh, but these federal policies really, really played an impact uh, on controlling native people. Um, I always say that the tribe are, are only talking about my tribe, San Carlos Apaches, is that we really didn't get a voice until the 1980s, until we started to learn, you know, what we we're up against. And and in the mid 80s, we, we learned that not only that we're dealing with the federal government and their federal policies, but we also were dealing with the economic developments around us and how that was going, how that was proceeding. And I think that's why, you know, even in Arizona, they really hated Nixon because it, it gave the opportunity for tribes to once again be, begin to argue about the environment and what was happening around us, you know, because uh, if, if those that can remember, in the 1960s, uh, the pollution was really bad. It was it was really really bad. Not only in the cities, but in towns, rural areas that had mining. And and you know the reservation I remember in the 1960s, you know from the smelters, was there was a thick thick smoke sitting you know uh, in the valley of our reservation. And uh, so the people began to argue, you know, at that point. Uh, against what was happening in, 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 with the environment. And then the conditions that we've seen, you know, things that were happening, uh, things that were 
were airborne and falling onto the reservation and, you know, just a number of different things that we've seen from mining. And uh, I really believe, you know, from native people as well as to unions, unions that were arguing about um, mining, about fair wages, and, and it went into the healthcare when they start finding out that a lot of miners were um, deceased from cancer. And then they started to look into, you know, why were people dying from cancer? And that was also in the 1960s, late 60s to early 70s. And that's when the mining company, you know, for a long period of time control, it was called the Miami Inspiration Copper Company Hustle. And they had controlled the hustle until the unions really started to argue the point uh, from wages and got into healthcare, and then it started to exploit the uh, conditions of people uh, being sick and then eventually dying from cancer. And in the '70s, again, you know, you've seen a big shift from mining uh, to transfer over the hospital, you know, to the local county, uh, but then keep a lot of their records. And you've seen a drastic uh, effort from minings to um, cover up you know, what was uh, being exploited at that time. And then, you know, the fight with the union to, to break the union in the 70s, you know. So, uh, you know, I, I give credit there because it really revealed a lot of the ugliness that uh, Copper was doing uh, really loose on their laws, their, their environmental laws and so forth. And that's where you see a, a, a pickup of... Uh, the environmental laws changing and kind of stiffing um, to protect the environment. And um, so I, you know, I think those days are forgotten. Um, I, I wish they weren't because, you know, it, we, we got to learn from uh, these effects that occurred back then and, uh, and, uh, and to really uh, be sustainable to the future about, about human life and, and the environment and, and wildlife as well too, because we've seen the effects in, in the wildlife. So anyway, you know, I mean, there, there's all these things that I grew up in. And um, the thing that I hated the most was that, you know, we, we were lied to because, you know, we, we were told that eventually that we would return, you know, back to our indigenous places. And they, um, you know, uh, from the federal government to the state of Arizona, they, and, and private sectors, you know, they, they took everything. And the only thing that was, that remains today for us on federal land is our holy and sacred places. And, and that's where, you know, we go and talk about Oak Flats because Oak Flat comes back to the religion of our people, the identity of who we are and uh, the roots that we have to creation. And our prayer songs, you know, the way we pray, our medicine plants, our deities, you know, this is all that resides in the mountains of, um, of Oak Flats and Mount Graham. And so, um, you know, so we at one point, I guess our people uh, relied on the Bureau of Indian Affairs because they have all these records. The United States has all these records. And, you know, so does the universities, like especially uh, U of A, the University of Arizona has a lot of these records that, you know, when they did a lot of uh, studies on, on Native people and Apaches and the historical uh, artifacts and so forth, you know, they, they have all of that. And and the point, the reason I'm saying that is because when, when it came to uh, Resolution Copper uh, to obtain uh, Oak Flats was that they had to get an exemption day one. They want. They never had the intention to do the national, uh, the the NEPA, uh, in, environmental uh, uh, laws. You know, uh, all that pertains under NEPA. They they never had that intent because they were going up against a huge wall um, with all these uh, records that have and all these things that have been identified, which which created the records from religion to artifacts, and you know what this place meant to not only to Apaches but you know, prehistoric to w what it meant to all the other uh, uh, tribes as well. And so Resolution Copper, again, uh, with real Tinto, day one, they had to go after the exemption. And they did, you know, they, they never had any intention to talk to nobody. And um, so it wasn't until 2014, 2015, when, when John McCain uh, snuck in on as a, as a writer to, be, to give them full exemption from all of this. And, and that's what we face today is how the United States Congress and how our leaders um, uh, handled that by giving a foreign company um, 
the pass, you know, by, by giving them this exemption, which, which now, you know, which a lot of this has come to fruition of how it's going to impact our religion forever, because it's going to be forever destroyed um, when it comes to the religion and laws that's supposed to protect religious, you know, uh, groups like ourselves. Um, with it being just a, a pit, a big hole in, in, in our deities and everything that is there is totally gone. Um, and then on top of that, you know, you're, you're talking about the in, environmental impacts that it's gonna cause because you're talking about deep water, uh, deep water that they're um, right now depleting, trying to deplete so they can get to, the, to, the, uh, to where the copper is at. And, and in the meantime, they're also contaminating deep water uh, for the for the environment, we look at it as two different ways. You know, one is is that if you contaminate the water, then it never could be used. And number two, which is also just as critical, is that it also uh, the way the old people try to explain it to the younger people is that they 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 use a, the vehicle for an example. They say it's just like your uh, radiator. You know, your your radiator has chemicals in there to keep your engine cool so it doesn't heat up well it's the same thing that deep water does for the earth it keeps the top of the earth cool and if you deplete all the water it's just going to get hot and then everything that is rooted is going to die and so those things you see right now happening a lot of these old oak trees and some of these young oak trees that still have a good 500 to a thousand years yet are now um, dying and you got arms of the oak tree you know uh, breaking off um, is really a, a sad sight to see if you've seen Oak Flats like six years ago and you look at what's happening right now and then you also see uh, like riverbeds when riverbeds go dry you see like patches well that's the same thing that's happening you, you see different places that are cracking in the ground and um, so so that's going to be a major you know impact when it comes to the water when we lose the water uh, of keeping the, the 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 land cool, the earth, and then on top of that, if it was to be used one day for domestic use, then that's totally gone. We we totally lose that, and so the groundwater runs uh, from what we know underneath and heads towards like Globe, San Carlos, and Safford, and then you have another mainstream that heads right down between like uh, heading towards Queen Valley in that area, but it, it disappears because it's so it's so deep, but but what's really critical that we say and that uh, some of the studies uh, that has been in opposition to it is that once you contaminate that water from the point of Oak Flats where they're trying to, you know, well, they'll, they'll shoot in the slur is that that's forever contaminated. So, so you're gonna see the contamination pop up somewhere, but it's all gonna be contaminated. And so it's real crazy that our leaders, um, you know, really, in that cycle of life, which is gonna end a lot of cycle of life, including ours. And you're gonna see you know, many of the animals become extinct. So it's gonna have a really a major uh, environmental impact uh, crisis that we're gonna be facing. And then on the top of that, with other studies that shows that with um, oak flats dropping into a pit, um, it's gonna be the furthest down into the earth that 184 degrees has to rise to the surface. So what, what they're saying is that 50 mile radius, you're gonna to have to add 10 degrees to what it is right now. And you know, this is all gonna happen when it subsides and then and then the heat you know rises to the top. So from the earth itself, from the land base of the earth where we walk on and stand on, is that it's gonna be 10 degrees hotter 50, in a 50 mile radius, that's for sure. And then on top of that, you know, I don't know, you know, it's, it's, it's there's, there's a lot of different ways of um, uh, important ways that, uh, of looking at the climate. But, you know, one of the important things is that when, when I was younger, uh, a lot of the elder uh, elders, you know, had showed me how the uh, environment works, how, how we're all rooted together and taught me about, you know, male mountains, uh, female mountains. And like when we talk about Oak Flats, Oak Flats is a female place because it can give you, uh, it can sustain life uh, from the time that you're born to the time that you, you die of an old age. So you could be there and survive because it has everything there. But there are certain mounds that are just like um, males that just doesn't do anything, you know, but, but they're there for a purpose. 
And so it's really, you know, critical to understand um, that. Um, I don't know if you want to call it science, science or, you know, a way of life or how everything is managed. But what's really critical is that when, when you have uh, these moist, moistures that come in from the ocean, and what, what people don't tend, don't see is how these mountaintops carve the, the clouds. And so from, you could be, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Mount Graham and uh, uh, Pinal Mountains. Uh, uh, there's another, uh, there's three other mounds, but anyway, those two that I'm familiar with is that when the clouds come in, they, they, these mounds act like knives. They, they, they carve out the, the clouds and the clouds go one way, the other one goes the other way. So you can stand there and actually at the peak of the mountain see it carve and then you see one go this way, one go that way. So what they're saying is that the one from Mount Graham, when it carves out, it goes, oh, it's called Mount Turnbull. Mount Turnbull will carve and it will, it will shift the clouds. And then it comes right over um, Pinal Mounds. And then from the, from the Pinal Mounds, it, it sends it right over towards superstition along the rim. You know, it sends it there. So what they're saying in this study is that when, when the pit drops, and, and 184 degrees has got to rise, then a lot of that moisture, the clouds are going to are, are going to evaporate. So a lot of this moisture is not going to reach where it normally goes anymore. I mean, and, and this is the game that they're playing with, you know, with life, you know, with with real life. They're, they're the these political leaders are, are playing with this changes that there's no way we can ever fix. You know, there's no way we will fix it. And I think when I go back to the 60s and 70s, I mean, that's why it was really crucial when, when they had pushed the environment, you know, the, 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 the NEPA studies, the, uh, all those things that pertain to the environment and the pollution was a really critical time in, in the country. And I think that we, we could have enhanced on it to make it even more productive and, and really protect, you know, those, these important places that we need. But when it comes to the political side of things, then you have the interference of corporations, you know, and, and you have the, the intent of what capitalism is and, and colonization. And, you know, I always tell people, you know, please, you know, I, I don't mean to offend anybody, but again, you know, I'm just telling you, I'm that last coil on that rattlesnake that sees so many things and witness so many stuff. And I said, and, and being that I've come from people who have been here long before anybody kind of have the right to say what I need to say as a warning. Because um, when, when it comes to, um, you know, capitalism versus the environment, um, I mean, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's like giving them a gun and, and the other one doesn't have nothing. And, 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 and that's kind of what's happening with our political leaders is that, you know, they're looking about, they're looking for today. They're not looking about tomorrow. They're not looking about looking down the road. They're looking about what they can do today. And, by deciding like that, they're, they're really killing tomorrow. It's really coming to an end. And that's why I tell the people here and the people around me is that if America is not going to change its ways, then we, we, we need to start looking at the more, more critical things that are going to happen. Because once these little animals become extinct, it's just going to go, it's just going to creep up to the higher, you know, to the higher uh, uh, human uh, coming to us human race you know because once they start to go well you know our, our lifespan is even shorter and I, I i really hate you know to see that because there's some um, critical animals that are suffering already are insects that are no longer around and those are warning signs that our people had talked about that if we continue to do what we're doing then we're really you know really digging ourselves in a hole of no return and so you know, being a, a former leader, that's what really upsets me about, you know, our congressional leaders, because um, just for an experience, we, we wanted to try out um, what does it mean to run for Congress? And so, you know, I went to the Democratic Party because as you read in my in my uh, bio that, you know, I, I, I worked really hard to get some of these people elected uh, as well uh, when, when Ann Kirkpatrick ran and Paul Gosar ran in our districts. I mean, we, that's where we kind of um, verified uh, how they flat out lied to us about how the, our issues will come to the table. They'll certainly bring it to the table and we would be a part of this. And it never came to be, you know, they, they had already uh, sided with Resolution Copper and they were already going to push on these exemptions. And then we find out that, 
you know, they were bought out already politically and, you know, were already committed. And uh, a lot of these politicians, even even today, you know, we're at Cinema and Mark Kelly and O'Harian, they, you know, they're, they're not doing anything to protect Arizona. They're, they are protecting the corporations, but not Arizona in the future. And so they're all tied. So being being a political leader, you know, I, I got to witness all the backdoor conversations and how things worked out. And they would tell you in your face that, oh, yeah, you know, we're, we're with the Native people. We understand it's important. And then at the end, you know, you see them on TV uh, in these news and they're, you know, making their decisions for corporations and not even thinking once or twice or not even questioning um, the important things about uh, what what it should be uh, for all Arizonans, and so it's it's you it's terrible. I mean, I seeing the back door and listening to them or them hugging you and saying, now, uh, hey, we agree with you. You know, your native peoples are right. You know, we need to incorporate that, but we'll talk about it later. And then when they talk about it later, they're on TV, you know, showing where their support is at and, and then saying all these critical things about us native people, which is, you know, not true. Uh, but anyway, the, the political side is, is one that, you know, I, you know, I, I guess if we're gonna live in this frame of a government, then these laws need to stay in place. And, you know, like for an example, when you get an exemption, how resolution got, Shouldn't that be a protocol to where there's a bunch of boxes that um, has to be um, X if they agree or not agree, you know, and that's one of the things that we asked the United States, you know, how, how did you give them an exemption? You know, what, what formula did you follow? And a lot of these, for, there's no such thing in some of these cases where a formula is, is followed to where uh, the United States can uh, make a good decision or rather giving them exemption or not. Is just based on relationships between congressional leaders and corporations and what they want. And those are the things that are, you know, behind the scenes that American people don't have the opportunity to see. And I think because me serving in a government tribe, as long as I have, you know, really uh, gave me a, a first eye view on, on what was happening and, and how devastating it, it was uh, to this country, not just to us. And, and how we lose so much of, uh, you know, uh, everything as a people. Um, so, you know, that's why I tell, you know, I try to say to the students out there that, you know, you, you may become a mayor, uh, council, you, you may become a governor, you know, you may become a senator, you know, but we, we gotta have some morals, you know, in those decisions that we make. And we gotta be smart at what we're doing and, and know that we have to look at all the pros and cons, even though it may not benefit us, we have to look at the pros and cons. And so in the political world, that, that's, got, that's a lot of work there. You know, I, I, really think, I really think we need some really new leaders. I, I really think we really need to grow these leaders, you know, uh, of all these important things about what a human race is all about and, 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 and begin to do away with, you know, the ones we have right now because they, they're easily to be bought. You know, they're easily, you know, to do something more uh, political. Uh, like John McCain, you know, when John McCain passed us, the, the guy that actually uh, helped and write up the bill uh, and supported it and, 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 and worked really hard for John McCain, uh, he's under Mark Kelly's staff. He's on Mark Kelly's staff, you know, and so when I talk to the political leaders and, you know, how, how did this come to be, you know, come to find out that, you know, that's one of the agreements they made, you know, in, a, in the political world is that, you know, if, if you hire him, uh, we'll support you. You know, he's done a lot of work for John McCain and, you know, he'll do a lot of work for Arizona. So he gets hired under Mark Kelly. And I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. You know, I mean, it, you, you can't even find a balance in the, in the political side. And because uh, as you all may know, we have the Save Oak Flat bill. And, you know, I've been working along with all the tribal leaders and not just tribal leaders, but people in the state working really hard but, you know, we get word coming out of Washington that our own congressional leaders, you know, ask Pelosi to pull the bill uh, that, you know, if they can pull the bill because they, they can't vote on it, they don't want to vote on it. And so, you know, with everybody arguing on the uh, uh, on the bill that was passed uh, uh, recently that Biden signed, you know, the, our, our congressional leaders of Arizona got what they wanted, you know, to to not be able to vote on this in, in front of the public. And I guess not really 
hurt Resolution Copper or, or offend them. And so, you know, they got what they wanted. So now, you know, that was in the House. And now in the Senate, you know, you know, if if um, Bernie Sanders, you know, um, decides to put it on, try to anyway, if, if there's still an opportunity, you know, then, you know, we still have our senators in Arizona that don't agree. And, you know, I can tell you firsthand, they, they have never heard, you know, the other side of the story. They've never looked at the other side of the information of the pros and cons that are going to come from it. You know, everybody's just looking at jobs and money. And yet this is robotic. You know, there if, if you look, if you research more on it, a lot of it is coming out of Australia and also uh, London. And it's going to be robotics, you know, and, and, and that's why a lot of the local miners here in the area turn against the supporting it because it's not, you know, picking up your lunch bucket and going to work. You know, it's, it's going to be robotics. And and they say, which is still hasn't changed, 75 percent of the uh, um, the resources is going overseas and only 25 percent is um, going to stay here. And that's kind of been their legitimate argument, I guess, to say that America needs 25 percent of that copper. Then my question is, you know, what about all these other minings that are going on right now? You know, where where is that copper going? Because they're still pulling a lot of copper you know, out of the Marinci area, uh, uh, Freeport McMoran, you know, you, you, you see an abundance of copper, you know, so it makes me wonder where all this copper is going, you know, uh, it, it must not be here in America. And, and that's kind of what I mean when it comes to the political side and the laws, you know, that's something that us all Americans need to begin to pay attention to what our leaders are doing and not have them have a free range of deciding on their own. Um, and then it, it comes down to the people of America, you know, where are we are at this point, you know, has America given up, you know, have we given up the future uh, of holding uh, life and sustaining life for our children that are yet to be born? Uh, are we now just thinking about us and then the end of our time and, and let this whole world fall apart? I think, you know, I really believe that we're in that critical point in time that we have to make these decisions. And if not, then everything else is going to fall apart. Because, um, like, we, what we say here is that you know all the organic stuff, you know, the natural stuff will be totally destroyed. And if there's no water, there's no water to support any of these organic um, stuff that is naturally, you know, uh, made uh, uh, for all of us. And um, you know, it's all going into a scientific thing, and and it's going to be scary, you know, because that's not going to include everybody. And so. Where we were, you know, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years, 40 years, 20 years, 10 years ago, you know, we're not there anymore. I, I, I really, we really look at the whole system in a whole different direction. And we, we need to all pull together. Um, if, if not, you know, if, because right now laws don't protect us. You know, uh, the, the United States Attorney made it clear during our Ninth Circuit Court hearing when nothing matters you know, from our religion to anybody else's religion and no matter how it impacts anybody. So, you know, the United States made it clear and that's one, I guess in the long journey of my work, that's kind of been it. You know, I, I, I've been after the United States to tell us the truth, tell us the truth, tell me so I can know how to rear my people, how I can protect them, tell me the truth, but they will never say it. They won't say it until we finally took them to the Ninth Circuit Court where the U.S. attorney made it clear that, you know, that it belongs to the United States and they're going to do as well. And, you know, how it impacts people, it doesn't matter. So they're just not saying it to the Indian people. They're saying it to everybody. And that's why I was telling the Christian people, you know, you know, ours is the oldest religion and yours is new, you know, but look what your own government said, you know, and I, I always tell them that it's really sad that uh, uh, we, we've been exiled out of Oak Flats, you know, but we've been sneaking back there, you know, every time we get a chance. And, and until I took it into the leadership of just going back there and staying there and just kind of deal with whatever's going to happen. But the United States couldn't afford, you know, to have a big uh, story on it. So they, they, they didn't bother me at all with me moving back this November then in the, this month would be two years that I've been there but anyway I got a chance to meet a lady from Superior a white lady and she is you know uh, uh, grew up in Superior and 
her parents were always in the mountains there in, in Oak Flats. And um, what was really exciting was that she um, knows our deities and, and she, she's had a lot of spiritual encounters with the deities. And so when I was able to come back and to stay there, you know, we, we, we got together and I really helped her identify who these deities were. But she also helped me um, locate and, and be in presence with these spirits. And it, it was it was really, you know, something that um, that, you know, I had someone to really help guide me back into this place of what is holy. And it was a white lady. So anyway, when it came to our uh, of, uh, of drafting, when when the United States asked, when the Tonto National Forest asked, you know, for statements from people. So we did our, our, our statements and, you know, she included hers. And when it came right down to it um, on, on the religion and spiritual part, uh, the, the United States, meaning the Tonto National Forest, uh, pulled out her statement and took it aside. And then I asked, I said, well, why did you do that? And they said, well, she's white. And I said, what do you mean? She was, well, she's white. She's not, she's not indigenous. I said, I know that. I said, but when it comes to spirituality, I said, that has no color. You know, anybody can touch a spirit. And anybody can be in the presence of what's holy. I said, this lady has been in the presence of what's holy. They go, well, it doesn't matter. She's white. And I said, but wait, 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 wait. I said, make that clear to me because you white people claim America as your home. You white people claim everything is yours. And now you're telling me that because she had a spiritual encounter that that doesn't belong to, I mean, that that's not something personal for her. And they said, no. I said, you know, we have, we're Christians and we have the Bible. I said, oh, so you're telling me that because you have the Bible, that all your holy and sacred places are on the other side, not here. And they said, well, something like that. I said, really? So I've been telling non-Indians across the country what their own government says about their religion. You know, and, and that's why I was telling religious leaders that you need to question the United States attorney, what she just said. Because, you know, and then also look at this case because um, a, a religious... Um, event, uh, well, not event, but uh, a, a religious uh, happening took place uh, with not only this white lady, there's been many more, but because you're white, you have no claim. And it really blew me away, you know, because I have family that were put as prisoners of war from the Cherokees that went all the way and settled in Oklahoma. And so when I go visit them, they have sacred places. They have sacred encounters, religious encounters with holy places there. And I'm not going to say, you know, they, they're, they're, it's not true. You know, that's the, the generation that grew up in that area. You know, that this is what's in their heart and this is what is home to them. And I said, you mean that same thing doesn't apply to white people from moving from Europe to here? I said, man, I said, white people got their own war with their own government because th that's what they make clear. And so I say that to, you know, everybody out there, because again, it goes back to the founding of this country with the fact that, um, you know, it's not on solid ground, you know, uh, of how this country was founded. It was, it was founded with a lot of lies and, and a lot of people were lied to. And I tell people in this country that I speak this way because this way of life, this capitalism puts you in a chain and you have to live within the frame and in their way. They dictate how you're going to get up in the morning, where you're going to work, what you're going to do. They dictate all of that. And I said, so I said, you know, for us Indian people, I said, the chain that's been put on us, we can feel it because it just happened. I said, but for you, I said, you've been on it for a long time. I said, so all we're trying to do is have you recognize the chains that are around your feet and your hands so that you can begin to break loose because that's not what religion is and that's not what spirituality is. You know, it's, it's about us all um, coming together and being together and, uh, and that's what's important, you know, if we're gonna have sustainability and that we're all from one, you know, we're, we're all one people. And um, there's somewhere that's gotta be enough is enough, you know, we, 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 we can't want more and more and more, you know, if, if that happens, then, then like talking to resolution, well, not talking to resolution copper, but I'm hearing what they're saying and them saying that they're doing this because of us. They're being, they're doing this because of you, because you want more, you want more, you want more. So they got to take more and take more and take more. 
And, and their alibi is that the people is not satisfied. We have to give them more. We have to give them everything they want. And so if that's the case, then that means that we can stop it. You know, we, we can go into a mode of where enough is enough and start really working towards that sustainability. And I think, well, I have the chance, you know, I'll, I'll certainly do what I can do um, to make a difference. Um, but anyway, I, I just kind of wanted to end there. I, I don't know what the time is, uh, how much time we got, but if there's any questions or anything or anything you'd like to, for me to elaborate a little bit more on, but that's more or less, um, you know, in a nutshell. Um, uh, I mean, if you want me to talk about a little bit more on the court case, you know, I can do that. Um, but I, I just wanted to let the listeners know who I am and, and why I'm so worried, you know, and, and I tell people that, you know, if you hate me, you hate me because I, I'm just trying to protect the water. I'm trying to protect the environment. I'm trying to protect all of us. You know, that's all I'm trying to do and, and, and not let people get away at will, you know, because when you, when you have tailings, you know, there's so much water that's used that's got to suppress all that into compacting it. And if you're exempt from a federal law, then that means put the requirement amount of water to suppress what's going to be airborne. And, you know, on, on top of that, when it breaks, where does it go? You know, how far is it going to go? Are they going to align this place? You know, all, all these thousands of questions that, you know, protects the environment is not being answered. And, and everybody's being blinded with how much money uh, they're going to make. But there's no guarantee to that. There's no guarantee at all, because when you're exempt from anything and everything, then you don't have to commit to nothing. And then after they're done pulling the copper, they're gone. Just like every corporation that, you know, I'm sure everybody's learned about is that once they're done doing what they're doing and, you know, they claim bankruptcy and they're gone, you know, and it leaves just a contaminated place that we all have to uh, deal with. But Oak Flats, you know, it, it, it's every part of the state of Arizona and this country. You know, one thing about this case is that, you know, it, it's exploited the uh, way the United States, our, our congressional people do business and how it's harmful. And also the integrity, you know, of, of our leaders too is on call. And it really puts a question to, Christ, to Christianity as well too. Where do, where do they stand? And, you know, for Native people, we're, we're always at the end of the stick. And, you know, it's, it's a scary place to be, but we're always trying to hang on to do our part to make things better. And, and that's, you know, again, that's what the stronghold is trying to do, um, is to make things better so that we can heal from this um, and, and find a better way of, um, of saving the future. And, but also know that, you know, we have to know when enough is enough and we can't be greedy. And, and that's what these corporations rely on is that we're, we're greedy. You know, we want more and more and more. And that's their answer. When, when you try, when, when somebody rebuttals them, that's always their answer that, well, it's America that wants more. The people want more. We got to do it, you know. And then when the people don't argue, then it gives them, you know, and, and, and congressional leaders don't stick by the law. It does give them that alley and that avenue to do at will what they want. So anyway. Yeah. We have three questions in the chat right now, and I'll go ahead and ask the first one and then follow with the other ones if you have some time. Um, what would you agree um, or would you agree that a lot of these uh, problems we have or have to do with politics than with race? It has to do a lot with politics, a lot, because uh, you it, it puts people against each other. I mean, because there is different classes of people, not, not, not in a negative sense, but I mean, there, we, we have different struggles and it puts, it puts a lot of people uh, being suppressed. The reason why I say it is because in a town of Globe, it's a lot of um, Mexicans and whites and we actually have their support, but because it's a mining town is controlled by the corporation is that they can't come out publicly and support us because when it comes to the chamber of commerce, they made it clear to the, to the, um, uh, uh, vendors to stores out there that, you know, they, they need to support mining if, if they're going to stay in business. And then on top of that, that's why when you mentioned earlier in my bio, uh, why we started the newspaper is because the newspaper controlled the media and what they were exploiting out there for the mines. So we're able to start our own newspaper to counter with the true stories and true studies and 
put it out there so the towns of Globe and Miami and Superior can begin reading that. So where I see a division being created comes from people who are, are suppressed by towns like this that are really run by corporations. Okay. Uh, the next question is, during the last presidential election, when it came out, the uh, native word or votes helped sway the Arizona vote. Did that give you hope um, that the native people of Arizona did listen? Um, and in what ways, this is a two-part question, <laughs> in <laughs> what ways can we bring more attention to fight to the fight for Oak Flats? Well, you know, um... I had experience with Ann Kirkpatrick and I had experience with Gosar. And, you know, I can tell you both on both of them, they, they lied right in our face. And even in front of our young youth that were there, there are adults today that could not believe that, you know, and, and, and that's politics. I tell them that's, that's a politician, you know, you, you can never really uh, trust uh, because there's a backside to them, to all of them that we don't know of and how much, you know, they're tied to. And if you look at the country, uh, how the country is run and how it's been, uh, you know, it's kind of been embedded in the way they do things. I said, so we have to be more tactical about it. I said, with even writing up mission statements before they're elected, you know, even putting it in their hands or having to make some kind of agreement. I said, it's just like, <laughs> it's just like um, disciplining somebody, you know, I said, to teach them how to be disciplined and, and do the right thing. I said, that's what I'm saying. If I can go to the young people and talk to the young people about morals and integrity and, you know, look at the pros and cons and make your decision of that. If they can be taught that, then they'll be good leaders. Evidently, you know, this was never really taught to these. And on top of that, they're not leaders. You know, as I was saying before, when, when I went to the Democratic Party, um, they tell me that, and just out of curiosity we we wanted to just find out they they wanted us to raise two hundred thousand, and that was going to go to the democratic party and i'm sure the republic party is the same and then they were going to look at who was the most beneficiary you know was it corporations or community people and then that will make them decide if the democratic party would support you or not so they're more or less telling me get from corporations and get a little what you can from community people then i was like well wait a minute Shouldn't it be that I get more from the community people because they'll show that they're more committed in voting for me than corporations? But it didn't matter. You know, they, they, they wanted their money. And so I guess what I'm saying is that a lot of these candidates that run is, is, is a money base. And that's why these guys will not meet with me, Mark Kelly, Cinema, all these guys, you know, because the questions that come up, very the very first question is, who are you funded from? I, I want to know that. And then what stocks and bonds do you have? Because we didn't know that one of them had some stocks in Resolution Copper, but when it became an issue, they bailed out of it. And then, you know, even with, with Jake Flake, you know, he was a lobbyist. And, and then you start looking, you know, the money trail and you find, you know, a lot of them tied to corporations already. And so they don't want to talk to anybody who's experienced in that to raise those questions to them. So, um, so in this election, you know, of course, you know, every, every, every election gives us hope. And... You know, what we say is that when the metropolitan uh, area is running tight, when it's a tight race, it's really up to the rule, you know, which way the rural areas are going to go, and especially with uh, District 1. And so I am, I mean, all the tribes, you know, all, uh, you know, they may be talking good with tribal leadership, but as far as constituents, they're not happy. We're not happy with them. They Right now, you know, they, they better do something before it's too late. Uh, because it really questions now uh, for us that it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat, you know, it's like, who is really honest? Who, who would really keep their word? Um, and how can we hold them to it? You know, um, if, if that's the way a vote is gonna go. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, you know, discouraging uh, um, because you're, 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 it's like air let out of the balloon again, you know, like, all these things that they, they say they can do great, they, they never do it. And it's just amazing, you know. Um, and, and yet Arizona, to me, Arizona can lead the way in so many different factors in, in this country and making it a better country uh, because we have the vast diversity and experience and plus being Native people that were the last in this country, we have so much to offer how we can make this a better place. So. It, it is discouraging. Uh, I know that talking to the Navajo people, you know, all the, the native tribes and the little towns, 
you know, they, they are upset. So now it's going to be, you know, either who comes and tells the truth that's going to do good for Arizona in the future or who's going to lie the worst, you know, uh, and lie again. You know, I, it, it's really hard for voters when there's a deceiving going on. And uh, again, we just have to pray for a good outcome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you for your time, Dr. Nosey, today. It, it's always a pleasure to hear you talk about um, Oak Flats and your journey here to fighting for it and uh, your background as always. Um, I want to let you guys know that in the chat, you have a link to our Native American Heritage Month uh, celebration activities, presentations. Um, if you want to check it out, you, you're more than welcome to uh, save it. If not, you can always search it on the GCC webpage. Um, the GCC uh, Diversity Committee is hosting a, uh, or yeah, it's hosting a uh, book club or a, uh, and a book discussion about the book Oak Flats. So if you guys are available on the link to the page is uh, information about the book club and the discussion on December 2nd, um, please feel free to um, reach out reach out to us if you have any questions about the book clubs or the any activities that are taking place um, throughout the month so if you have any question any other questions for me please uh, feel free to email me uh, dr nosy you are all set thank you for joining us today thank you very uh, much. thank you thank you i'll start recording this